to continue on step one tonight. We admitted that we were powerless over the effects of our separation from God and that our lives have become unmanageable. And the scripture tied into that is, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Romans 7, 18. I want us to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 9 tonight, please. Share something with you first. We're going to talk about Saul's conversion tonight a little bit. The examples in the Bible are all about conversion. You know, it's like when we get saved, the, the, the people were so different that their names actually changed. They were totally different people. And unfortunately, that the church has lost that message these days. You know, when we go in, we're supposed to come out a new creation. Not the same anymore. And you know what? People should recognize that. Anyway, let's listen up on this. By exploring our powerlessness, we will have to confront and oppose negative ideas. Okay? Negative ideas that tell us that being powerless means being a victim. A lot of us play victim. By coming to an end of our own power, we develop enough humility to hear the voice of God and to do His will. The Apostle Paul, before his conversion and transformation, when he was still known as Saul, could not explore powerlessness at all. He was intoxicated by the power he could wield, even if it placed him in opposition to God's plan for his life. <clears throat> Yet God pursued Saul, despite his power-hungry, murderous state of mind, to call him to a new direction a totally transformed purpose so that he could stop persecuting the gospel and stop preaching it. God made him totally blind and dependent on others to be led, fed, and shelter him. He had to accept powerlessness and unmanageability in order to be used by God in powerful and amazing ways. We must also first accept our powerlessness and inability to manage before we can be freed from our addiction and our sin nature and become a channel for God in ways we could never imagine. We are so schooled in the thought that we can do anything we put our minds to that it's almost impossible to envision the power of God in us doing what we have not been able to do to this point. But God in us, shining through human vessels, gives us the ability to recover, to accept powerlessness, and to accept unmanageability. We are then open to a life powered by God, rather than our dependencies, our sin nature, and our addictions, or our fallible selves. What a big amen there. When we open the door to admitted, see, victory comes at the admission of defeat. Once we admit that we're defeated and powerless over changing what the, the, our sin nature into a new nature, once we get to that point, the fight is over and then God can come in. See, you can't come into a prideful heart. So you have to be able to admit that I'm a sinner, I can't do this on my own, and I need a Savior. Once that happens, and we accept Jesus into our lives, this power of the universe called the Holy Spirit enters into all of us. Now, this is not something, some people experience some kind of emotion from it. Some people don't experience anything at all. But the fact of the matter is, the Holy Spirit is in every believer that believes in Jesus with their whole heart. And every believer has the power of the universe residing inside of them. We have the power to say no to our sin nature. We have the power to say yes to our new nature. We have the power to nurture our relationships with others and with God now. All of us have that power, but that power has to be developed, okay? And the power can only be developed when we're humble enough to admit that it's not our power that is going to do this. It's called the resurrected power. We are new creations. We are not the same anymore. And in God's eyes, when we believe in Jesus, we are not. There's nothing that we have to do to perform. All we have to do is believe that, and God already sees us perfect. We have to understand that. Now, 
We're in the state where we're in this world and we're not perfect. We still have a flesh, a sin nature, and we still have pride issues and performance issues. We always want to perform and think we're going to get an A-plus with God if we're good, if we don't retaliate or say anything mean or swear. You know how I was always taught, be a good boy and God won't punish you. God's looking at you right now. You know, I was always taught that I had a, uh, was a punishing God that was always looking at me. I said, I can't. <laughs> I, I, I got to run from God because I can't, I can't toe the line here. But then when I understood who God really was through the Bible, we understood that his power has to go through a channel. And we're that channel. And it's such a privilege to have that power. But either we can use it for the good or we can use that power for the bad. Because the Bible says, be careful not to destroy one another. So one thing we have to understand is we have to stay humble. Humble humility is the best thing that a believer can be in a humble state of mind all the time, not thinking they're better than anybody, not comparing themselves with anybody, not trying to retaliate, not trying to take over their lives again. Unfortunately, we still have this flesh that wants to do that. Our flesh is against God, totally. We're born against God because of the fall of Adam. So once we admit that, we get into step one. Paul was... A Pharisee of Pharisees. He was being taught through theology how to become a godly man and to follow all the rules of the law and the religious leaders. But he had no heart for God. See, he was killing Christians and persecuting Christians because they weren't towing the line. They weren't doing this, doing that. They weren't following the commandments and doing the law. So they said, well, we got to kill him. Because that's what the Bible says. If you can't follow these things, you get stoned to death. So they, they were, he was killing Christians until what? Paul got knocked off his high horse. And we're going to read about that conversion. And the problem is we have to get knocked off our high horse. Because we get prideful too. Thinking that we had something to do with this. This recovery, this change. The only thing that we, the only thing that we had to do with it was accept it. Other than that, we had nothing to do with the power. Because the power can't come from humanism. The power can only come through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. See, but we have to learn. We have to learn how to channel that power and how to recognize that power. Because if we don't know the difference between our power and God's power, we'll always think that it's us doing it. So we have to understand how weak we are and that I can't, I can't be the person God wanted me to be. That's why I accepted Jesus into my life. And now I have to let him fix me. So when we do that, and when, when, when the victory comes, who should be getting the glory for it? Jesus. The Lord gets the glory because we couldn't do it. Now that we can, that just proves that we have the Holy Spirit in us. And there was nothing in our flesh that does it. All right, let's read the conversion. Listening, um, it's um, Time to Choose. It's on um, 1395. Let's read the Time to Choose for us. <clears throat> We're going to read Acts 9. We admitted that we were powerless over our problems and that our lives have become unmanageable. There are important moments in life that can change our, our destiny. These are often times when we are confronted with low powerless, with, with how powerless, when we are confronted with how powerless we are over the events of our lives. These moments can either destroy us or forever set the course of our life in a much better direction. Saul of Tarsus, later Paul, had such a moment. After Jesus' ascension, Saul took it upon himself to rid the world of Christians. As he headed to Damascus on his mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Saul picks himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Acts 9, 3 to 6 and 8 to 9. Saul was suddenly confronted with the fact that his life wasn't as perfect as he had thought. 
self-righteousness had been his trademark. By letting go of his illusions of power, however, he became one of the most powerful men ever, the Apostle Paul. When we are confronted with our knowledge that our, our life is, isn't under our control, we have a choice. We can continue in denial and self-righteousness, or we can face the fact that we have been blind to some important issues. If we become willing to be led into recovery and into a whole new way of life, we will find true power. So you see, it's a choice. It says, if we become willing, right, if we, to be led into recovery and into a whole new way of life, we will find true power. So there's only one way to find the power of God. And that's through this, through the recovery process. You can't find the power of God any other way than through this. When we become willing to be led into recovery. See, we are being led into recovery right now. That's why we're here. Right? We, 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 we we're led to Jesus, and now we're led into recovery. Now, after, after Jesus, after salvation, what? Well, recovery begins. Okay? After... After that, the conversion begins of... The conversions already took place in heaven with God. You are one of His kids. Now the transformation from becoming a believer takes place. And that transformation is what we're going through right now. Our powerlessness and to get off our high horse and admit that I need Jesus, not just for the, just to get saved, but what? To continue to be saved until we go home to be with Him. All right, let's read the, let's read the account. Saul's conversion, chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the rest of any followers of the way. He found there. Wow, I guess we're all going to get arrested. <laughs> we all belong to the way. Yeah. Think about that, though. Do you see what he asked for? They were killing the Lord's people. He was eager to kill the Lord's followers. His religious pride blinded him to God's people. How many times does religion... Stop us from finding Jesus and killing Jesus. Isn't even in the church when religious when religion takes over, Jesus isn't there anymore. You know who's there? Satan. The devil. The church becomes a synagogue of Satan. Mm -hmm. We start to follow what humanism and human teachings and human ways and human rituals that have nothing to do with Jesus. And it blinds us to the fact of our recovery with Jesus. And the devil loves religion. And the devil loves the denominations. Because that stops us from being in unity. You see? If the world would just wait, if Christianity would just wake up and say, wow. The Bible says until we all, in Ephesians, until we all come to such unity that the, that the church would be such a powerhouse that this country would be so powerful if the power of the church was back in order that Jesus would be recognized everywhere we went because the principles of the Bible would stand firm as they used to. That's why there's a church on every corner. But as long as religion and denominations divide the body, there's actually more unity in the world system. You see? That's the problem right now. Because you, you, in, in, in Jesus' eyes, we're supposed to be able to walk in any church and hear the same thing, yep. the Word of God. Not any ritual, not anything else, but the pure, unadulterated Word of God. Yep. Not, nothing added to it, because if you add anything to it, the Bible says, you're cursed. So that's why the church is accursed, because they add to the Bible. Now, that's why we don't do that here. Now, let's, let's, let's just read it. I wish all the churches would read this account. It said... The followers to bring them both 
All right, let's just back up to So we went to the high priest, verse 2. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation and the rest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them both men and women back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heavenly heaven suddenly shone down on him. He fell to the ground, and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Then he asked a rhetorical question. He said, Who are you, Lord? So he knew he was the Lord, but he still asked who he was. Right? He said, Who are you, Lord? <laughs> Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Now, there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over the straight street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. So see how the Lord uses different people all the time? Now, the Lord could have opened his eyes by himself. Why did he get someone else involved? Because we can only have relationships with the Lord in community, in fellowship with each other. You can't do it on an island. Or why would even why would he even bother with Ananias? The Lord said, I'm just speaking to you, Paul. No, he spoke to Ananias to help Paul. He was trying to teach everybody that we need to help each other and communicate with each other here. Because God speaks to all of us. You see? He don't just he didn't, he didn't just speak to Paul or Saul, he spoke to Ananias too. The, the thing of it is we have to hear his voice. Now he says, when you get there. But the Lord exclaimed, verse 13, listen what he said. But Lord exclaimed to Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. So Paul, Saul had a bad name. He got a bad reputation because he was killing people. Okay? And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest anyone who calls upon your name. Here we go. But the Lord said, Go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. So Ananias went and found Saul. So, so he obeyed his voice, right? He obeyed the voice of God, right? So Ananias went and found Saul. He, had his, he, he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so you might again regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Now, Saul in Damascus and Jerusalem. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. Now he didn't wait. He didn't say, I gotta think about this now. He heard the voice, and what? He obeyed it, and he started what? Preaching. How many times do we hear God's voice? Got a call from him. But never what? Act on it. Because when you miss the voice, when you miss the call and act on it, you what? You never get to it. Now look what it says. All who heard him were amazed. 
Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem, they asked? And didn't he come here to arrest and take them in chains to the leading priests? So in other words, they knew who he was. They're saying, who is this guy? This cannot be the same guy. He was just killing us, and now he's proclaiming Jesus. So something happened to him, right? He didn't just say, oh, I believe in Jesus, and that was it. No, he's, no he believed in Jesus, all right. And what? He was a different person. The church is missing this message. That you don't come to church and just believe in Jesus and go about your merry way. When you believe in Jesus, what the thing of it is, you become like Jesus. That's the conversion that takes place in each and every believer. That's proof that the Holy Spirit has entered you. Something happens. Now listen. Saul's preaching became more and more powerful. And the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. Now, we're talking about the religious leaders. They're going to kill him. So, <laughs> but so, listen... They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him, but Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. What were the believers doing? They were working in unity together, right? They didn't let Paul get killed. They helped him get out of it. They didn't run the other way. They worked together. Why? Is the church not working together? Why are not everybody inside the church not working together? Why does everybody think that, oh, all I got to do is go to church and I can go about my merry way saying, no, we need to all work together as one body. Many parts. Many parts so we can overcome our flesh and become Christians. And become what? A, a different person. We don't do them things anymore. We don't go and do the things we used to do because now we have another goal, right? To glorify God and to live a life that's worthy of the call. That's why he saved us. Is that being preached in the church today? No, just believe. Just believe it. Just believe it and you're going to be fine. Believe it and go live sin double sinful. It's even better. Believe it even now. You can prove to everybody that you're saved. Go, go, go sin it up. Do you really think that God sent his son to this world to go on that cross and get an agonizing death and crucified so you could keep doing the wrong thing and saying, I believe in Jesus? Does anybody know how foolish that sounds? He sent, just, just think about you sacrificing your kid for people. To say, I want you to continue living the way you do. I'm sending my son so you can keep doing that. Kill him. I'm going to put the blame on him. Would you? Nobody would even think of doing that. Even God wouldn't think of doing that. He says, I'm sacrificing my spotless, sinless son for you bunch of sinners so you can become sinless. That's why I did it. And that is not getting preached in churches anymore. You're getting the watered down message. God's grace just saves me. I can just go on murdering, drinking, partying, doing whatever I want, and just go about my business and believe in Jesus, and I'm going to heaven. Do you realize how stupid that sounds? How silly that sounds. Did anybody to even think that's why Jesus died and that's why you came to church? You are just under the control of the devil if you think you can keep doing that. Because if the Holy Spirit's in you, you don't want to do that anymore. You might fight against it. Listen, I'm not saying that you're going to be perfect. Your, 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 your flesh is going to war against doing God's will 
but it has something happens to you where I don't want to do that anymore. Even though you might fail, it's not something you want anymore. Now you're saying, I don't want to be like that anymore, but I'm, it's still so strong in me. I still continue to do it, like Paul was saying in Romans 7. But he hated the sin that contaminated his life. He didn't say, oh, Jesus saved me because I love my sins and now I can do more because I get a free ticket to heaven. Do you realize how stupid that is and that's what the church is teaching right now? Yeah. Prosperity. Just pray. Listen. We pray, right? If we pray, the Bible says in James, the prayer of a righteous person avails much. When we live a sinful, disobedient life and think we're going to pray for people and God's listening to us saying, oh yeah, don't worry, yeah. Go kill someone and pray to me and then I'm going to heal the person you're praying for. Do you realize that we hinder our own prayers? If you really want your prayers to get answered when you're praying for your loved ones, praying for people in work, praying for everyone, he's saying, the only time I'm listening to you is when you're obedient to me. And then I might make a decision to answer that. So don't think that I'm listening to you when you're not. Because I don't hear a word you're saying. Do you see how those messages are not going out there like that? Because just think about if everybody heard the right message in churches, they all said, all right, I got saved. Now it's time to change, become a new creation, get into recovery, stop praying for our country, start letting Jesus take over our nation and, and being on the throne again. Do you realize how great this nation would be again? Amen. It would be blessed beyond measure. All of us would be. But no, we don't need that message. All we need is, I believe it. And I'm a masterpiece. Just because I believe it. No, you're a Rembrandt. You're a fool. That's what you are. Don't you? Does anybody really think they can fool God? You can fool a lot of people. You can come to church. Hi, everybody. I'm doing so good. When you just cuss somebody on the way in, flip somebody off, yell at your husband all the way to church, cursed and thought, sinful thoughts and came to church, Hi, everybody, I'm doing great. And God's saying, hypocrite. Why do you come, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I say? How do you call Lord, Lord of your life when you're still the Lord of your life? You say messages like this, we empty out the church. Why? Well, all right. No, nah, that's not the message I want to hear. I want to get this verse out of the Bible, this grace piece, put it over here, take that piece out, throw that one in the fire. I don't like that one. That one doesn't. That one's for the Jews, not me. That wasn't for me. That one's for the Jews. That one's for the Jews. Now tear that, tear that one out. Wait a minute. What's that say? Oh, sexual sin. Oh, that's not me. Rip that out. I don't have that. That's not me. That, that's for the Jews. That's not for me. I, who told you? Oh, my pastor taught me that. It's okay. Who's that guy getting partying so much? Oh, that's not for me. Never that. that was for the Jews. They don't. This is what. This is what people do. Unfortunately, people follow the leader. So if there's somebody leading a church into the synagogue of Satan, God's going to take care of that pastor that's doing it but he's not going to excuse the people in the congregation right. saying you're following him saying my word tells us clearly that that's not my teaching and if you're going to continue to follow it it's because that's what you want because yep. mm -hmm. that's what you want you want to live a sinful disobedient life and then go to heaven when you die Now, can anybody say the Holy Spirit is in that person? No. When the Holy person gets inside of you, boy, you know. Listen, I have a strong Italian flesh that does what it, it's full of pride, anger, bitterness, resentment, payback, you name it. And God said to me, 
that's not who you are anymore. No, that's not you. You're the guy in the Bible now. Love, joy, peace, patience. That's, I saved you, that's you. See, see, see this book, this book is for you, John. This is your, this is your owner's manual. This is you now. You have to learn these ways to live and how to speak and how to be what? Have empathy for people, not pay back, keep no record of being wrong, have holy amnesia. That's you, John. Now, the choice is up to you, John. Do you want to do that? Or do you, wanna, do you want to go back this way? Because I'm not going to invade your life. I'm going to come in if you ask. And you knock on the door, I'll come in. But if you don't knock, I'm not coming in. So in other words, it's a choice you have to make every day. To admit that you're powerless. I am so powerless over my sin nature without Jesus in my life that it will control me till the day I die. But now I have this other power. Then I admit that I was powerless. Said, okay, you're admitting that? Yeah, now I'm going to give you a power that is so powerful that it makes your sin nature look easy to take care of. Mm. To say no to. The power of the universe. You have it. So your sin nature is like a flea to the power of the universe. If you want to. Not you, if you, look, you sin because you want to sin. Okay? You have to admit that. You don't sin because you don't, you sin because you want to. Don't blame it on, oh, I'm just weak. You say, oh, I'm just weak. No, no, no. You're just stupid. Because the Bible, <laughs> the Bible says, <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's, true. it's funny, right? but it's true. You're just stupid because you're saying I'm just weak. No, you, the Bible says when I'm weak is when I'm strong. <laughs> Who says you can't fix stupid? You can fix stupid with Jesus. <laughs> Other than that, you're stupid. You're a dumb sheep. The Bible calls us a bunch of sheep. Think about what we do. Tell me that we don't self-destruct. Tell me we don't self-destruct. We do things that kill us to live. Right? We take drugs to live. We drink to live. We overeat to live. We overthink to live. We overspend to live. Everything in our flesh, and thinking that's kill, keeping us alive, and that's the very thing that's killing us. And we think that it's keeping us alive. There was a song that, I, that was way back. It was the name of the song was "Killing Myself to Killing Yourself to Live." And it was uh, Ozzy Osbourne sings it, and Black Sabbath sings it. Killing yourself to live. He actually knew that what, what he was doing, he was killing himself just to get another day of life in. Yeah. Right? Partying, doing drugs, psychedelics. Uh, have you ever, you ever listened to Ozzy Osbourne now? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh -huh. That's because he killed himself just to live. Now he's vegetable, like a vegetable. Instead of using Jesus, he used what? The world, the devil, to live. And that's what happens to us. Sin is what kills us. And the Son is what saves us. So, wouldn't it be wise to just admit that we're powerless and that our lives are unmanageable so we could have the power that created this whole world living inside of us? Wouldn't it make sense to do that? Why are we so rebellious against it? How many people refuse to accept the fact that Jesus, how many people refuse the fact to say that, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't believe in Jesus. I believe in this, but I don't believe in that. How many people are saying, what is so hard about believing that, that creation, that God, that something created this? What is so hard about rebelling to say, oh, yeah, no, I don't need that to live. Why? There's another power. It's called Satan. There's a power that we can't see. See, this is what people are confused about, even believers. Because they can't see it, they don't think it exists. Mm. Right? Yeah. There's a power that exists that's more real than what we see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? 
the supernatural forces of the universe are way more, way more reality than what we're seeing right now. Okay? Everything that's going on right now, to the air we breathe, to the stars in the sky, to the, everything that goes on in, in, under, that we can't see is stronger than what we can see and more powerful. And, what, and people say, I'm not going to, I, I got to see it to believe it. How many doubting Thomases are there? Mm -hmm. But how many times have we seen Jesus doing miracles in all of our lives? Yeah. Yeah. Right? But instead of banking on that, see, we're always to bring to mind when something happens of the victories we already had so we can hold on. Because sometimes it takes time for that to until the next victory comes. Till we hold on. So we want to lose our faith, lose our hope, lose our strength, lose everything because God's not working fast enough for us. Instead of our faith life being developed, He's trying to develop our life to, tr to trust Him more and put to death our flesh. And That's why journaling is good. Yeah, yeah journaling is really good to see where you were and where you're going and where you are. How many times God came yeah, how many times God's came into your life and did things for you? Because mm. what did it say in Deuteronomy? Teach it to your kids. Say it. Write it on the doorpost. Put it on your foreheads. Put it on your hands. Put it some a reminder everywhere because that's why the, the Lord made all the, the, the jubilee and all the days and all the festivals to bring to remembrance the things that he did for them. The blood on the doorpost. All that stuff. When he freed them from slavery. But that's what we do. We forget. Yeah. Just like we do. Yeah. When you get, when you go home or when you go to work tomorrow, we forget the great things that Jesus did. Then we become Jesus again. Becoming flesh again. Attacking people. Saying what we want. Being mean spirited. What did we do? We forgot. Yeah. We forgot. How many times do we forget? We never forget, I'll tell you what, we never forget when somebody wrongs us. Yeah. Oh, no. You could, if, if I really sat and thought about the things that happened to me through my life that were bad, I'd be able to think about them and, and, and I'd bring them all back like they were here yesterday. Yeah. But all the good things? Yeah, right. Hummer, hummer, hummer. Yeah. Oh, remember when that person did this for you? Do that? Oh, that guy's a jerk. <laughs> he, I, I, I try to, I try to call him. He never answered his phone, so I hate him. Yeah, sure. And I'm gonna tell everybody else he's no good too. Assassinate his character, and give everybody an opinion of somebody they don't even know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We give other people opinions of somebody we don't know just because they did something to us. Yeah. We trip to somebody else about it, and they hate him too, and they don't even know him. Yeah. And that's why the world's a bunch of backstabbers. That's a song too. They smile in your face, right? All the time they want to take. And you know what's unfortunate? This backstab is right inside the church. And you're saying that we have the Holy Spirit. People are tripping about people in church. God, you know, gossip's the biggest sin in the church, right? And it's one of the things that God hates the most. Why do we so quick to gossip about somebody? Is it to make ourselves feel better about ourselves? Why? Why do we want to tear somebody down just to feel better about ourselves? Who's that? Is that Jesus? Jesus was trying to, even the people that were coming up against him, he was helping. Yeah. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. So this, you know, as we go on to step two, is come come is becoming a believer. That's what it is. Step one is admitting that we're powerless, and step two is coming to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Because isn't it insane to kill ourselves to live? And doing the same things over and over again and expect something different to come out of it? That's insanity. But you you ask a million people if I went in the church and asked everybody. Hey, would you say that you're insane? <laughs> Not me. I'm a good person. <laughs> I love it. I'm a good person. I love it. But you, you see how blind we are to ourselves, right? 
I'm a good person until somebody, some, somebody crosses me. Let's see how good I am. But anyway, thank you for letting me share that. And we're going to continue on the last week of step one.